Good morning, my Real News Media TV family. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning, and I'm wishing for everyone a wonderful and a productive day. And in the news this morning, two hospitalized following Manchester crash. A woman and a man have been hospitalized following a two-vehicle crash on the Kendall Main Road in Manchester on Thursday. Barnett Brown, a JPS contractor, said about 5 p.m., he and his nephew were traveling through the area of Tiki Tiki to restore electricity when a Honda car traveling in the opposite direction collided with his pickup. May I come down the road and I go on duties and me see the driver of the Honda come towards me and him straight over to my side and slap in on me and write my vehicle off. He said while pointing that the road was wet at the time of the crash. The people in the Honda jerk up bad, he said in reference to the injured man and woman. Up to 6 p.m., police were on the scene directing traffic. Woman gone down off Maxfield Avenue A woman was fatally shot by gunmen along Nelson Road off Maxfield Avenue in St. Andrew on Wednesday night. Investigators reported that about 7.30 p.m., Irene Lang was sitting at her gate on Nelson Road when a motor car with armed men aboard drove up. Two men alighted the vehicle and opened fire on Miss Lang. The wounded woman was later pronounced dead at hospital. Superintendent Damon Manderson, head of the St. Andrew South Police, have listed Romario Grant, otherwise called Kaka, and Irons as a suspect in the shooting. He said Grant has been listed as one of the division's most wanted fugitives. Superintendent Manderson urged Grant to surrender to the police and warned that anyone caught harboring him will face the full force of the law. Bail extended for five accused of abuse at Atlantis Leadership Academy The five men charged in the abuse case at Atlantis Leadership Academy in Treasure Beach, St. Elizabeth, appeared before the St. Elizabeth Parish Court on Wednesday to answer to the charges. The employees are facing charges of assault occasioning bodily harm, cruelty to a child, and assault at a common law. They were charged of following investigations into alleged abuse at the American-owned institution for troubled teens. They had their bail extended until September 26, when the matter is expected to continue. It was reported that boys at the institution were allegedly beaten by adult staff members, forced to exercise until they vomited, and placed in stress positions four hours at a time. Gangsters targeted under Hanover curfew Following the recent outbreak in lawlessness, which includes five murders in three separate incidents within a 24-hour span, the Jamaica Constabulary Force has launched a 48-hour curfew in some sections of Hanover as part of an effort to rein in criminals. The curfew, which started at 6 p.m. on Wednesday and is slated to end at 6 p.m. today, has seen the security forces covering townships such as the parish capital Lucy, Johnson Town, Elgin Town, Q District, and the Brissett community, which are seen as a criminal hotspots and a potential hotspots. When he recently visited Johnson Town, the home district of three of the murder victims, which included a father and a son two weeks ago, National Security Minister Dr. Harris Chang said that while progress has been somewhat slow in curtailing the lawlessness, gangsters would not be allowed to operate with impunity in the parish. The police are making progress, but it will take some time. There are too many young people and too many guns available and too many young men who are willing to kill their friends, Chang said. The men killed in the Brazen Johnson Town shooting were identified as a 41-year-old Mary Calvin, his 21-year-old son, Merrick Calvin Jr., and the 29-year-old Greg Green. They were all shot and killed at an under-construction building on the seaside adjacent to the Johnson Town Main Road. When the news spoke to a resident of Johnson Town on Thursday morning, she was seemingly unimpressed by the imposition of the curfew, arguing that it is a method that has been tried before without any greater success. This curfew is like a stopgap measure. We have had them before and they had not produced the desired result, the woman said. We want the government to flood the parish with soldiers and police. Criminals must be scared to walk the streets of this parish. Hanover, Jamaica's smallest parish behind Kingston, once had the enviable distinction of being Jamaica's safest parish. However, over recent years, 
criminals are fleeing justice in neighboring St. James and Westmoreland, and the lottery scammers, seeking quieter surroundings to operate from, have taken a liking to the parish. Last year, former Hanover Police Commander Superintendent Sharon Beeput told the news that one of the main challenges facing the police in that parish was trying to keep gangsters who see Hanover as a safe haven out of the parish. However, the parish's newly minted a commander, Superintendent Andrew Nish, whose crime fighting resume in St. James was most impressive, has made it quite clear that the criminals will not flourish under his watch. I have one message to these violence producers, and it is that we cannot survive together in this parish, and I am not the one who is going to be leaving, Nisha told the news in a recent interview. The investment of those who are seeking to build the parish must be protected, and the residents who want to live in peace must be allowed to do so. Expert witness details a blood spatter patterns in Clark murder case. Highlighting the intricate details of the crime scene, a former government forensic analyst on Thursday provided crucial insights into the positioning and the nature of blood splatters found in the master bedroom of Keith Clark's residence after he was shot dead 14 years ago. She is the first of the nine witnesses who the prosecution indicated earlier this week that it would be bringing to the Home Circuit Court for examination in chief as the murder trial continues. The blood splatters on the items of clothing from inside the closet, as well as on the eastern wall to the back of the closet, they suggested that Clark could have been injured whilst in an upright position, as opposed to lying down. The witness said on Thursday in response to a question by prosecutor Dwayne Green. The blood splatter on the northern wall, which is to the end wall of the closet, was at a low level, which suggested that Clark could have been injured whilst lying on the floor or that he sustained the injury to the lower part of his body, such as his leg, whilst in an upright position, she said. She further explained that Clark could have been injured while in an upward position based on the height of the blood stains. Green asked the witness how she had arrived at a conclusion that the blood splatter on the northern wall suggested that Clark could have been injured while on the floor. So those were at a much lower level, so it's either he was injured at a lower portion of his body, like the leg, and it splattered on the wall, or he was pretty much low down on the ground at the time he was injured, she said. Green further asked the witness to explain how she concluded that Clark sustained injury to the lower part of his body while in an upright position. Using the back wall of the courtroom to demonstrate, she explained that the blood splatter on the northern wall of the closet was at a lower level. Based on the shape of the blood drops, you could tell the direction the blood actually impacted the wall. From the bleeding source to the wall, it was coming down in a going down or downward position, she said. She said that she tested the master bedroom with the Castlemere kit, one of the two main classes of forensic tests commonly employed by crime labs. The witness said it was a combination of three liquids, and that she used the glutton paper to touch and lift some of the stains from the wall. She also added regents, and they were taken to a laboratory for further analysis. This test is not a confirmative test. It is a presumptive test to suggest that the drops I saw on the wall, I tested could be blood. I was only able to determine the sex or the gender of the blood stain, which was male, human male. So that confirmed that it was human blood, she said. She further reiterated that Clark was either in an upright position when he got a shot in the lower section of the body and the blood splattered on the wall, or he was lying down when he got injured and the blood splattered. The witness advised the court that she visited the Clark's residence on October 10, 2010, but based on the length of time between her visit and when the incident occurred, it could have impacted the evidence that she had to examine. For one, the blood stain would have been far less degraded, would be more intact, and likely to give a more conclusive result in terms of DNA, and based on my observations, I did mention that the scene was disturbed, she said. Meanwhile, Justice Dale Palmer and the defense expressed to the prosecution that they did not wish to go into the next court term, which starts in September, without a ruling. The case has been ongoing since 2012, 
when Chief Prosecutor Paula Llewellyn ruled that the three soldiers, Lance Corporals Greg Tinglin and Odell Buckley, as well as Private Arnold Henry, be charged for killing Clark at his home. Clark was shot 21 times on March 27, 2010, during a police military operation to apprehend then-fugitive drug lord Christopher Dudos Koch. Guys, thanks for watching. Please join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. for another news update.